As climate change progresses, the infrastructure and supply chains of businesses that were built to withstand prior historical conditions are today becoming vulnerable to the increasingly frequent and heavy precipitation events. Also, extreme temperatures, rising sea levels, and intense climate hazards. And so resilience planning and strategic investment helps organizations ensure that their systems continue to deliver reliable performance in the face of changing climate. So in the next few minutes, let's learn how we could approach this data problem where we need to combine multiple streams of private, public, and third-party data to derive predictive insights. In order to dive in, let's focus on a specific use case, such as analyzing wildfire risk for an electricity transmissions operator. Do note that any business can use the same process similarly for other types of climate hazards. Great, and so from this, let's first start by defining the time frame for our planning period. Long-term multi-year analysis is important for maintenance forecasting and replacing existing infrastructure, but a lot can change. It's also incredibly helpful from a crisis response perspective to analyze, for example, the spread of wildfire in the next 24 hours. For climate risk analysis, the sweet spot is looking at the upcoming weeks and months to both encompass emergency planning and mitigation per season. So this will be our goal. With that in mind, the ideal output is a map that shows areas of high risk of wildfire that could impact electrical operations and nearby communities, and also offer preventative recommendations such as removing brush from this area and from that area. Roger that. So then let's assess then what kind of information we're gonna need. Like a recipe almost, we'll need the following data ingredients. A data set that is labeled with areas of risky plant vegetation that can fuel a fire. This is key in order to predict the probability of a fire. We will also need several data sets for different land and weather conditions, such as elevation and wind patterns, since these factors can help predict fire direction on slopes, humidity, soil moisture, precipitation, and the minimum and maximum temperatures by week or by month, for example. Awesome. With that in mind, let's now dive into the process. Here's the architectural diagram. For starters, we will need labeled data, which we can find either online or have teams or partner organizations manually labeling data if it's very niche. Labeled data means having tags for a wide variety of examples. We ideally want a balanced data set containing around the same number of examples for each kind of tag. As an example, we go to our local firefighters office and ask them about wildfire risk in the area. They hand us a printed map with high and low risk areas on different seasons. We then go back to our computers and use mapping software like Google Maps or Earth Engine, for example, to create polygons in a map from the highlighted regions. Next, we select a thousand or more random points that are of high risk and another 1,000 low risk points to avoid bias when we feed these examples to an ML model in a bit. Next, we want the elevation and weather data along with our fire risk labels. So using Dataflow, which is a scalable data processing tool, we fetch data from Earth Engine's public datasets that can come from different satellite bands. And next, because we want the model to analyze images rather than individual points, we also fetch the surrounding pixels of each point to create examples of high and low risk pixel patches for our model using the Earth Engine's function ee.image.getdownload URL to request the data. Now, two cool things to call out here for you. One is that Earth Engine normalizes all these different geospatial data sources to enable us to work with the same format. And the second thing is that Dataflow helps us auto scale all these data requests that we are making to Earth Engine. So they all happen in parallel, reducing the time from hours to minutes, which is beautiful. Awesome. Also note that if we want weekly predictions, we need the data from the prior weeks. And similarly, we need the prior month's data for monthly predictions. 
Now we have examples of high and low risk areas, including the weather and satellite data. We're almost ready to train a model. Next, Dataflow splits the training examples into two datasets, one with the majority of the examples for the model to learn and adjust, and the other for the model to validate on data it has never seen before. And as a friendly note, one of our favorite frameworks in our developer YouTube series called People and Planet AI is that we use convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, as our go-to when working with satellite data. Because they work just like our eyes, they analyze images and find patterns for us. CNNs are great for training a model based on images because it infers context from the arrangement of pixels without having you to explicitly tell it. Exactly. And so next we use TensorFlow Keras, which is a powerful ML library to define our model and create our training script, which we use to train the model in Vertex AI, which is an AI managed platform. Note that in Vertex AI, we will choose TPU or GPU processing chips for this AI workload because it significantly shortens the training time over regular VMs. Exactly. And next, we play with the model until we're happy with the results. For example, we can have the model predict the fire risk of the same map we got from the firefighter experts and compare how well it did. Once we're happy with the model, we host it in CloudRun as an online prediction service. CloudRun is an easy to use managed web platform. It only uses resources per request instead of having machines running 24 hours a day. And it's also available in low carbon footprint regions. Now to visualize the predictions in a useful and actionable way, this is the creative part and where the magic begins. I agree. And we can initially prototype this in a Colab notebook or create a wildfire map layer in Earth Engine's editor called a mask. But eventually we can build this out in a formal map-like web app that labels pixels from zero to one. Zero being of no risk to one being high risk and colors them appropriately to pop out. We could even filter for high risk areas that are surrounding electrical infrastructure. We can also show scorecards with summaries of the risk analysis. We can even filter by date or show a month by month visual based on average historical weather to see, for example, what does July compare to versus January. And from a reporting summary, we could also have these visuals stored as images into cloud storage and automatically exported into a Google Slides presentation. And there you have it. A quick walkthrough on one way to do wildfire risk analysis. Other hazards can be done in a similar way. We just need the right data. So what's next? If you want to learn more, we have a notebook with all the code you need. It goes step by step on how to create an AI model that generates land cover maps. They help to keep track of changes on the earth like deforestation or urban growth. You can also follow us more in our People and Planet AI episodes, which I have linked below with other helpful resources. Cheers. Bye.